Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Franklin. Jason is a PhD student from CMU. Um, you may be finishing up next year or so. Um, but in any case, um, Jason has been working with uh, Yuri and me on uh, trying to have some uh, formal reasoning about uh, kernelized browsers. And there you go. OK, thanks. So what I'm going to describe today is a, a framework or a platform we've been developing uh, to ask questions about web primitives and web browsers. Uh, and so this is motivated by the sort of the continuously evolving web. So uh, ever since its inception, the web has been changing, and, and new applications have been coming into the web. Uh, originally, web browsers, uh, their primary purpose was just to <laughs> sandbox uh, malicious content from, from honest content. Uh, and as people have been pushing, uh, pushing on the web and, and, and producing more complicated applications with richer user experiences, uh, now we've seen that web browsers are, are taking uh, content from multiple different parties and aggregating it together. Uh, and so now there's this interaction, and there's an increased need for security uh, between these content. So in particular, uh, web browsers now provide primitives uh, for client-side interaction. One of these, one example of a primitive uh, is the post message uh, call. So the post message uh, mechanism provides the ability to send messages between domains. So when previously we wouldn't allow uh, information to flow between domains, now there's this primitive in the browser that allows you to do this. Uh, and one of the interesting nuanced aspects of post message is that you can provide this star operator. Uh, and this operator says, just broadcast this message um, to any of the other domains. So in the case that you're sending a secret and you got a little sloppy, uh, you may have put in this star operator uh, and you may have just broadcast your secret to a malicious domain. So this is just one example of where designers made a decision to allow a particular operation or allow a particular um, you know, wildcard operator or something like that in their design uh, and didn't necessarily fully understand the implications of such. So if we were to consider the design, we'll see that uh, basically what we're doing is we're posting a message uh, from a source to a destination window, uh, and that window should have a particular target domain. Uh, and there's this, you know, side case where the target domain is just free, let it be anything. In that case, the message gets sent. So academics and others have looked at this particular uh, primitive uh, and decided that maybe we should instead restrict it uh, to not allow such a wildcard character. Uh, and so all sorts of different proposals are continuously being made for these different changes to web browsers and to web standards. Uh, and the question is really what security properties are provided by these different mechanisms uh, and against what adversary models. So it's these sort of questions which we're going to try to build a framework uh, to better understand and to be able to experiment with. And we're not going to be able to answer all the different forms of these questions, uh, but we want to build something which we can give to the designers of web browsers and web primitives, uh, and so they can start asking these questions themselves. So uh, the problem is basically that new primitives uh, are continuously being proposed and developed. Uh, in, in particular, HTML5, which is the new major standard, uh, includes a number of new primitives for interaction and security. Uh, these primitives are complicated. Uh, the, the, the standards themselves are taking years to develop. Uh, they're composed of many different pieces, and people aren't even certain how these pieces interact with one another. Uh, and often, security isn't the primary concern of these particular pieces, although it is a concern. I mean, if you look at the standards, you'll see that they have you know, sort of security restrictions after the different parts of the specification. Uh, but these are just specified as, well, please don't put that wild card in there if you have a secret, or you know, please don't do this, or please don't just do that. Uh, and people either don't follow these, uh, don't understand the underlying assumptions, don't understand how strong the security properties are, um, or don't understand what the adversary models are. And so these are all the things that we would try to clarify uh, by building a system where people can ask these questions. And so in general, the implications of these design decisions are not well understood. Uh, and what we're going to argue uh, is that to better understand these implications, uh, designers need a framework for principled design and analysis. So I've described a little bit about what brought us to this point, what motivated us to build this platform, and the problem that we're seeing. Um, I'm going to talk about what the requirements are for a good solution. What are the different properties we think that a good platform would provide? 
Uh, I'll describe the approach we took that's based in logic and formal analysis. Uh, I'll talk about uh, building a browser kernel in this framework uh, and, and performing some initial analysis, although this is in progress work. Uh, and then I'll talk about what other questions can be asked in the future. Uh, I hope to sort of spur on um, some discussion with the audience as what would be interesting questions to ask here. Uh, and then I'll provide you with some open problems which I dealt with in the process. Uh, I think you know, maybe members of the audience can help me solve these problems that may be not obvious to me how to solve them. Uh, and the caveat to all of this is that you know, we've done this in about 12 weeks. Uh, this project probably will take uh, another month or two to complete. And so a lot of the things that you'll see are you know, not completely finished. So feel free to jump in and say, well, I think you know, if you're working on that, I would change it like this or I would do something like that. So what are the requirements for a good framework? Uh, so these are requirements we just developed on our own. Uh, and if you guys can think of more requirements, feel free to let me know. So I think a good analysis framework uh, for modeling at this level should be able to, uh, to be abstract. Uh, it should focus at the design level, not the implementation level. In particular, what we're doing here is we're looking for logical errors in the specifications. Uh, we're not considering things like buffer overflows or null pointers uh, or, or um, you know, pointer arithmetic uh, bugs. Uh, because these aren't the things that show up in the high level in the specifications. Uh, and more practically, implementations for a lot of these things just don't even exist. Um, they're rolled out slowly. As people build the specifications and the standards, implementations may come out slowly over time, but you'd like to be able to catch bugs before these implementations. Before they go out there, researchers look at a particular implementation and say, oh, you probably shouldn't have done this, or you probably shouldn't have done that. So this is sort of what we're targeting here. We're focused at this more abstract, mathematical level. Uh, level of logic. We'd like to be at, um, as automatic as possible. Uh, because we're building this framework to give to other people, we don't want to uh, hand them a giant burden. Uh, we don't want to say, okay, here you go, you can make your simple modification. That'll just be a couple years of your time. So we'd like it to be as automatic as possible. And I'll talk about what is automated and what is not automated, and what the burden is on people who use the particular framework. We like that it's sound. So we like it uh, when you draw conclusions from the particular analysis, uh, that these conclusions are valid. So basically what we're saying here is it, it's uh, an approach that when you find bugs in the design, you'd like these bugs to potentially be, also be there in the implementation. Uh, and finally, since we're giving this to other people to use, we'd like it to be extensible. So part of being extensible is that it should be modular. Uh, when I provide it to a designer, they should be able to augment in the additional component they would like without having to go through the rest of the system and completely modify it. Uh, we'll see how we enabled modularity by, by reducing specifications down to just the components which are relevant for the particular specification uh, and, and by uh, just modularly componentizing the system itself. Uh, and sort of as an HCI aspect, we want uh, the system to be sort of steeped in familiar language constructs because we're giving it to people who aren't necessarily experts in, in formal methods, uh, who don't want to say program just in first order logic. Uh, we'd like things to be similar to the languages that they're used to using, uh, in this case something like C Sharp. So here is an outline of our, what we'll be calling logic -based, logic based analysis of system designs. So this is actually uh, an approach which was developed uh, in conjunction with my advisor at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, but it's, it's left very open here. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to instantiate the different components in different ways. So what we have is, in the center of it is an analysis engine. Uh, this analysis engine is sort of what's taking in the different parts of the system and, uh, and inducing the decision about security, the proof of security. Uh, the different parts of the system are the secure system itself, what, the, what we're modeling. Uh, in this case, a browser kernel, um, a formal model of the adversary. Uh, and what differs from our model of the adversary versus a lot of other models of the adversary is that we're specifying it in term, the adversary in terms of their capabilities, not in terms of a set of, of attacks, but in terms of a general interface to the system that they have. And then we allow them to sort of go willy-nilly and, and try all the different options at that interface. Uh, and finally, a security property. So these go into the analysis engine and out we either get uh, a counterexample or a, a proof of a particular security property. So let's look at, for this particular framework, what we instantiate at each of these different boxes as. Oh, and so I guess what the proof would imply uh, in a security sense is that the adversary with these particular capabilities cannot launch a successful attack which violates this security property. So, yeah. Absolutely, at a design level. Yeah, absolutely everything uh, in this talk will be at a design level. Um, 
Although you could consider pushing it lower and lower and specifying more refined properties. OK, so to start, um, we picked an analysis engine. Uh, we picked an analysis engine that was built in-house by Rustan uh, in the RISE group. Uh, so Daphne is a, a verification platform. Uh, it's built on a number of other layers, uh, in particular Boogie and the Z3 uh, theorem prover. But some of the key features for our, uh, for our interest are that it's based on an object-based language, and it looks a lot like C Sharp. So it has a lot of the same uh, properties you'd expect of uh, object-oriented programming language in terms of classes, uh, references, dynamic allocation. Uh, and it's a sequential language. So this, was, this would be something that comes up later, is that we're modeling here uh, sequential programs. So in addition to being able to model systems, you can also specify properties in Daphne. Uh, and these are built in, in terms of pre and post conditions, um, loop invariance. Uh, and also has the unique property that you can specify termination conditions. So one of the experiments which we'll do uh, by using this framework is we'll look at a browser kernel when no one really considered that it might have some liveness properties, that it might have some concerns with an adversary attacking it and trying to make it uh, not terminate. Uh, we'll do an experiment where we look at a design of a browser kernel, we specify a liveness property, and we show that indeed the browser kernel has this additional security property which the designers of the system didn't even consider. All right, so these are the kind of questions we want to ask. We want to say, you guys forgot about this sort of attack. Or what about this adversary model? Uh, we've added it in, and we've tested it, and it was done in a relatively simple, modular way over the course of a week or so. Uh, and finally, as a part of uh, making more abstract design, uh, the specification support in Daphne uh, provides a number of different mathematical objects, like sets, sequences, uh, mathematical integers, algebraic data types, uh, and user-defined functions. So these are all what help us sort of abstract away from the fine-grained details of the implementation. So as an example, um, we may consider a channel, a message channel, but we'll model it just as a sequence, right? So we won't have to consider pointer arithmetic or any of the details of the implementation. That's how we get away from these implementation bugs and look more at sort of the abstract design level. And to just, yeah. Uh, ghost variables are just variables that aren't really part of the program that allow you to say something about the specification. So you can sort of add new variables that aren't compiled down. So to prove to you, uh, sort of, that uh, Daphne looks a lot like other languages you have seen, uh, here's a simple URL class. Uh, it just has sort of three members, a protocol, a domain, and a port. Uh, and then here's a mathematical function which says something about what a port, uh, when a port is valid. It's, it's valid if it's you know, greater than or equal to zero up to some port max. Right? And so this is just sort of uh, a simple class that looks a lot like Java or C Sharp. And this is sort of the level which we're programming this system in. So it's not you know, elaborate first order logic formulas which define the entire program. It's, uh, it's something like this. OK, so we've seen the analysis engine uh, and what we're going to be using to do a lot of our analysis. Now let's look at what, what we're actually targeting the analysis towards. So we're looking at browser kernels in particular. Uh, and so what is a browser kernel or a kernelized browser? Well, it's a, a traditional web browser which has had content presentation uh, and handling moved outside of the trusted computing base. So the yellow box here outlines a part of, outlines what would be a traditional web browser. It includes content presentation and handling as a part of the sort of the kernel of the browser. Uh, kernelized browsers themselves, or, or these kernelized browsers, have removed content handling from that uh, and instead have a smaller trusted computing base. So what their goal is, is that they're going to be the exclusive manager uh, of principles and all system resources. And one of the keys here is that they also enforce all the security properties. Right? So what, what people have done is they've taken these jar, giant monolithic browsers and separated them out into different components uh, based on which, what properties those components uh, satisfy. And one of the key parts uh, about enforcing all the security properties in just the browser kernel is that it greatly reduces my verification costs. So I didn't have to take Internet Explorer and strip out all the components which weren't relevant for the security properties of interest. Right? This would be something that you may have to do in a much larger project, or you might have to prove something about these, these components which are relatively benign from a security standpoint. So this is a good example where there's sort of a symbiotic relationship between good security reasoning uh, and, and reducing the costs of verification. Because these kernelized systems have already taken this first step and stripped out a lot of the irrelevant components. 
So I want to describe a little bit more detail about the browser architecture that we're looking at. So browsers themselves uh, separate different components based on principles. And these principles are defined based roughly on the domain names. So as you can see here, we have four different uh, domains that are separated into four different principles. Uh, and they're all using different runtime engines or renderers. Uh, and these runtime uh, uh, systems and renters, renders all access the browser kernel through a particular system call interface. So the browser kernel here is managing all of the resources of the system. Uh, and it's, it's also putting the content processing in the principal space. And that's very different from what traditional browsers do. So this is the, this is the system architecture which we're looking at throughout this talk. So we've seen the system and the analysis engine. Now let's consider the adversary model. So we know that the adversary is specified by a set of capabilities. But it's not always clear when you read a paper on security as to what the actual adversary model is. In this particular case, the designers of this, of this kernelized browser were very clear as to what the adversary model is. It's that of a malicious renderer or malicious principal instance. Uh, and, and the part that particularly clarified was that they specified what exactly the interface to the system was. So this makes it, makes it very easy to specify. What they've said is that this adversary is con constrained to a system call interface. So a CSI adversary is an adversary that's constrained to a system interface. Right? And so these are sort of the ideal adversary models, or it's an ideal way to specify an adversary model because it makes it very clear as to what their capabilities are. So this also allows us to very easily model what the adversary is just by making a demonically non-deterministic call to a system to a, a particular interface. That just means that they're trying all possible parameters and shipping those off to a particular call. So in this case, uh, unlike previous cases where I've taken months to model the internal adversaries for pro projects, this took me like 15 minutes. And all I had to do was say, well, OK, just make a non-deterministic message and send it to that system call. And so there's a very simple adversary model it's very easy to see that it corresponds with what the designers had in mind. And it's also something that's easy to change. So you now, by changing the system call interface, you've changed the capabilities of the adversary. You've got one place where all your adversary's power is concentrated, and it's easy for you to see, OK, let's strengthen it by giving him more capabilities. Let's take away some capabilities. Yeah? OK, I, I want to understand why you say it's easy. because. The, the syscall, there are different permissions, right? Like, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know the detail about, uh, yeah. about the service OS, but uh, in a Windows system or uh, Linux, uh, I mean, you have different syscalls. It doesn't mean you right. have the capability to call every syscall with uh, the, uh, every possible parameter. Right? That, that's actually pretty complex to model. Right? I mean, do you have the same problem? Because you were saying, uh, given the syscall that. interface, in 20 minutes, you can specify the, the so, I, I guess uh, it depends how exactly that system is, is set up. But um, in that particular case, you could maybe separate out the system call interface over the different privilege levels. And then you could sit an adversary at each different privilege level or an adversary across different privilege levels and say, oh, well, they can make all of these calls. Yeah. And then just say, you know, non-deterministically call each one of these in any order uh, and try to violate the properties. I think the easy part about it is that someone told me it was the syscall interface. So I've had other uh, projects I've worked on which use the same approach where someone handed me like the spec for the TPM uh, and said, what do you think the adversary is here? And so you know, after like weeks of reading, I said, well, maybe it's this. I don't even know. They weren't totally unclear to me as to what they were thinking about. And this was so clear, right? It was just, it's this system call interface. Just make non-deterministic calls there. Yeah? I don't understand the counterexample. The TPM has, a, has an interface, too. Why is what's the difference? So the TPM has an interface, but the adversary model is it's not clear as to what the adversary can access in a particular interface. So the typical, what you hear for a TPM uh, is it's a software-only adversary. Uh, so that is, doesn't just directly map as cleanly to the interface calls um, of the TPM. I mean, there's other examples, too, with just hypervisors and, um, you know, yeah. But it's kind of the same thing, right? You have an interface that uh, you need to sp split them into groups. Yes. Yeah. Uh, modeling different privilege, right? I mean, here you also have the same issue, right? There are a bunch of this cause mm -hmm. some uh, privilege. Uh, I mean, maybe here it's more uniform because uh, they all have the same, they are all in the same privilege. Right. It is, I think it is all the same. I think, I think it's all the same. I think the way we should probably be modeling systems adversaries is all as access to some interface. It's just a matter of how long does it take me to identify the particular interface 
uh, tease that out from either big implementation that I've been given uh, or the design of a, you know, a large specification where it doesn't say these are the, exactly the calls that the interface, uh, that the adversary can make. I mean, I'd like to see adversaries specified as this, just tuples of calls and say, you know, this adversary is this particular, these particular functions, it can call any of these. Uh, you know, this is very different than like a network adversary, which is, you know, something like potentially receiving messages, have, taking some actions. I think this is a general approach to specifying adversaries for systems. And is everything that you need to know about um, the, the malicious principle in this message, or is it possible that the browser kernel is going to look like inside the memory space of the, the, the malicious instance and yeah. make it bytes there and maybe that matters? Um, from this particular level, like, you know, considering just the browser kernel itself, sort of abstracting the underlying system, uh, everything about the adversary is just in that message. Um, and really all of the operations that it could potentially undertake are just, you know, allowing it to send all possible messages. I think there are, you know, certainly more complex models uh, for adversaries where you could, you know, have multiple different interfaces. Perhaps an interface to memory would also be provided or perhaps, you know, things like that. So this is just another example where I think sound security decision making and reasoning uh, has you know, reduced the verification cost for me. It made it easier for me to understand what the adversary model was. So uh, finally, uh, <coughs> let's look at the security properties component. So we're utilizing Daphne's uh, built-in support for specifications uh, using pre and post conditions, loop invariance, uh, and termination uh, specifications uh, to reason about the security properties. So, we're looking at both safety and liveness properties. So as a safety property, um, what we're saying is that the system avoids particular bad states. Uh, and the safety, these bad states are defined by uh, the browser's own policy, which is the same origin policy. So the same origin policy uh, defines an origin just to be a protocol domain name and port. So you know, HTTP, S, you know, colon slash slash, um, you know, mail.microsoft.com port 80. Right? So that would, be, that would be a particular origin. And the same origin says you should, the browser should separate um, all the principles based on this origin. So I'll go on and talk a little bit about how we're formalizing that, how we're going to build into this system. But this is just a high level. Um, and there's also a liveness property that we're looking at. Uh, and that's basically that all system calls will eventually terminate. So we want to avoid non-termination for system calls. So we look at how we actually might specify uh, something like the safety property. We'll look at part of the browser that, that checks origins, uh, and we'll give a post condition to the particular method that just says that it's only returning true if the different subcomponents of the origin are equivalent. So this is actually, people that know uh, Daphne, this is all reduced down. It wouldn't actually uh, well check. But, uh, but uh, this is sort of how you might go about specifying sort of these sort of same origin policies. And, and this would then sort of propagate throughout the program. And eventually, we would want the system call interface to have this as a post condition, right? Saying you're only able to make these particular updates. Um, the adversary, you know, can't make these particular updates, right? So the adversary only gets to modify principal instances if it is that principal instance. Yeah. If I'm a developer, I want to use your system, do I need to also write down some definite specification? Yeah, you, yeah, I mean, so you'll have to both program the new part in this language uh, and provide the yeah, logical you, specification. Because uh, the policy is saying, I have a secret, uh, I don't have a secret, uh, must be specified, then you can check if the, yeah. it's, it's being met. Is that right? Yeah, so in the most general case, no, uh, I don't think no. the web developers will need to do that. Well, okay, so there's, there's different cases. If the web developers are adding something which they think would modify the properties, the browser, or whoever the developer is. Are you talking about web developers? Yeah, I'm talking about web developers. Like, uh, yeah, well, whoever like, wants to like use the, the framework. Website example. Yes, letters. yeah, like the motivation example. I mean, who tells you this is a secret? Oh, I see what you're saying. You mean, you mean more application level semantics? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought you meant like people that are design, building web primitives. I like no, no, augmenting no, no. the system. No, no, no. The webs. Oh, no. So from this perspective, we're basically just looking at the browser kernel and saying, what should the browser kernel provide? Right? It should be able to isolate principles if they wish to be isolated. We're not saying anything about what the particular semantics of a principle are. You know, like maybe they have security properties. You know, they're providing non-interference within the particular principle context. 
Well, that's something we're not really reasoning yeah. about. How, how do you stop the, your motivating example? So like, my motivate. I, I use post message in the wrong way. I didn't want to tell everyone, but I right. had a star then. No. So, so that's an example where people then said, why don't we modify post message? Let's rip out what's currently there, and let's put this new thing in. But then the question is, well, is this new thing secure? Right? Or what about all these different primitives that we're building into the browser? What properties are they even providing us? Uh, and a lot, of the, a lot of the problems from the application developer's level is that they don't even know what the clear statement of the assumptions are or what the clear state of the properties are. I guess I was thinking about a related but different problem. Right. Is that people can, the web developer can put a specification and say, I know this is a secret. Right. I'm not so sure what uh, the star means. Right. If you right. start right. the program works, right. then you are somehow some system can tell me, oh, you mark it as secret, but you use star that's right. right. It's not so perhaps in that case, that's a different is automate problem. post message to say post secret message. Right. And then there's a clear specification that says, oh, then that's only going to be delivered to this particular target domain. You can say, okay, you know, no other domains can infer what that secret may be because of, uh, you know, parts of the browser which may potentially leak it. Okay, so let's take a little bit uh, deeper look into what the security properties are that we specified so far. Um, what we've looked at is uh, a safety property uh, based on the same origin policy in the browser kernel. So what it does, the browser kernel looks at different principal instances that have different origin and it separates them out into groups. Um, so each one of these is separate because they have a, different, a distinct origin from any other uh, principal instance. And so what we try to specify here is then a sort of strict non-interference property. We want to be able to say that there's no information flow uh, between these different principles in the system. So the principles here are defined by the same origin policy. Uh, and what roughly we say in the system is that if you observe the low security inputs and outputs of a particular origin, then this provides no information about the high security inputs of other origins. Uh, so this is a property that we've been, we're in the process of specifying. Uh, and putting into the system. We have some parts of it done, but it's sort of in progress. Uh, yes. Sorry, uh, for a not very security person, could you explain what you mean by uh, low security inputs? Oh, that? sorry, okay, yeah. So um, what we'll do roughly is say that if you consider, um, you can look at each of the different principles. Maybe a concrete example. Maybe concrete. Okay, what yeah. Yeah, so uh, if you just had, um, Say one principle that's running in your browser is your, your bank's web page, right? And you have some important information in there and some uh, unimportant information in there, um, the high security and low security information. Or maybe you want all the information to be high security in this case. Uh, and then you have another principle running, which is, um, I don't know, bit, some pirate bay or something. You're downloading some movies and you're searching around. Well, you want to keep what pirate bay can infer about your bank's information to, be at, to an absolute minimum. Right, so the browser is trying to prevent information from being disclosed about your bank's web page, right, and so that they can't determine anything about what's happening in that other simultaneously running principal instance. What's the difference between the input and the output? If I type my password into the bank and it, it gives me my balance, is my password the input and the balance and output, or are both sure. the inputs? Uh, however we want to define it. I mean, uh, in this particular case, yeah, maybe the, maybe the um, password is a high security input. Okay, so it's okay for it to get information about high security outputs? Oh, uh, no, part of the definition is also that, that those sort of are, are never released. <coughs> um, but you don't really want them to be able to, you don't want the, the uh, Pirate Bay, uh, from its perspective of what it's seeing, it, it, you sort of assume it doesn't see the high security outputs, otherwise it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Uh, from the perspective of what it's seeing, these low security inputs or outputs, um, you don't want it to be able to sort of infer any information about the high security variables. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, you are certainly not considering extensions in this model right now. We're not. This is a browser kernel. So, no, but you can have an extension. Okay. No. Yeah. So I guess something that you could do is perhaps uh, well, specify I, your extension. Are you talking about plugins or like no, a plugins and add-ons? Plugins are, are just plugins is just considered as a runner. Sure. And uh, for uh, extensions, so there is a difference between plugin and extension. The extension, such as Firefox yeah. extension, that's JavaScript based. Yeah. That we don't have. Yeah, that that's. Okay. And of course, that can. A plugin is different from this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess if you wanted to augment the browser kernel with some sort of concept of an extension, 
you could, you know, go ahead. You have a framework of a browser kernel at the design level. You could add your extension in there and try to prove that, you know, as long as the extension is honest. That would be a malicious extension that can read data from one origin and pass it on to one other. Sure, sure. So those extensions. Then you wouldn't be able to prove that the browser kernel provided that interference. Well, what, what you do is you sort of have an extension to the browser kernel, an extension to the API, right? And then you sort of model the extension, uh, the malicious extension is one that's not determined by the adversary is calling the extension API, right? But then it's unclear what kind of security properties you want to prove it because <coughs> sometimes you want to be able to uh, attach us all. Right. All principles. Right, right, right. But the, this goes back to these, you know, these studies that you know, people have done while looking at extensions and see what the problems are. And from that, you might be able to infer this is the problem you want and you could specify it. And then you could get some confidence that your extension functionality was capable of providing these uh, guarantees. Yeah, so they have not. <laughs> okay. So one of the issues with this definition of security is that browser kernel today? Uh, browser kernels today allow flows of information between principles, right? So something like strict non-interference isn't necessarily going to apply when you have this post-message primitive, which allows you to directly send information around. Um, so this was an initial experiment. You could check that in the absence of post-message primitive in your system that uh, strict non-interference holds, uh, and then you could augment your system with post-message. Uh, see that indeed. You know, because of this new functionality, strict non-interference does not hold, uh, then you could ask a new question. So you could formulate a new definition of security uh, and see if this new de definition of security holds. So we, we're doing exactly this. Um, what we're doing now is, so consider again a browser kernel in four different principal instances that are each in separate groups. Um, and consider now that principal instance one decides to send a message to principal instance two through the browser kernel. Well, in this case, what we could do is we can consider principal instance one and principal instance two as a single group now. Because they've communicated with one another, we can sort of put them into their group uh, and do this as however often um, members communicate with one another, aggregate those into groups, and prove some sort of grouped non-interference property. We're saying, you know, secret information about this particular group isn't flowing to other, another group, right? So this is the same exact thing, but now consider everything in that purple box uh, to be one principal instance. So you can't consider this is a relationship with transitive, so you can class it into one group. We are, yeah. I mean, but there, are there any implications, security implications? Like, uh, because P1, P2 may mean different things, uh, one is uh, ads, one is, uh, or yeah. some, one is Facebook, the right. other one is a website that provides right. Facebook application. So like, uh, they they kind of not. In, like a symmetric. Yeah, but from the browser kernel's perspective, you really have no information about what is happening inside of the principal instances. So we're, since we're only looking at the browser kernel, we're only, only seeing what's provable at the browser kernel's level. Uh, you know, we can't say that even, can't say anything even about that message to, you know, from P1 to P2. That might have just leaked all the information from the bank to Pirate Bay. But at the same time, you know, the browser kernel just sees a bit string. It passes it along if it meets some requirements. If we had more information about, you know, P1 is, has this policy, and P2 has this policy. You know, maybe those policies could be pushed into a reference monitor in the browser kernel. But, the, but the, there is one direction you can either infer as a post message has a direction as P1 talk to P2. It's right. different from P2 talk to P1. Oh, sure, sure. So we could, so, uh, yeah, I guess I could build more of a directed graph here or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, that, that could be a, a further sort of refinement, a further strengthening of this property is rather than saying these guys are all the same because you sent some information back and forth, here's been the flow of information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and these are just the questions I can continually, you know, ask. No, just a, a wonder the trade-off, right? I mean, what's the trade-off you were thinking about uh, for picking a group instead of directing a problem? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I was sort of assuming a model where by giving some information from P1 to P2 that you know, they could then infer other things about each other, maybe through other channels and things like that. So I was just sort of saying, well, let's all consider these the dirty group and this is the clean group over here. Um, so this is just uh, an extension. Um, this is something we've yet to prove about the browser kernel, but I think this is a property that is provable about the, the particular browser kernel we're looking at. Uh, and maybe sort of a general specification of non-interference for systems which can't look into the applications themselves and, and determine anything about the semantics of messages. So if Pirate Bay sends a message to the bank, it gets put in the same 
yeah. group housing. Would that allow Pack Pirate Bay now to subvert the bank because it's now in the same group? Well, so what would happen is that we would just say that there's been a flow of information between those two. Um, they're, put in the, they're put in the same group in the sense only of from the perspective of our analysis. We'll say that there's been a flow of information from this, in this group here, but there's been no flows outside to any of these other groups. Um, and from the browser kernel's perspective, it's not changing their principles or anything like that. Uh, it's enforcing sort of the same properties. We're just sort of considering how information has flowed throughout the system. So one of the extensions we wanted to look at are liveness properties. So we've looked at some safety properties, sort of avoiding bad states, but we also want to look at uh, if the browser kernel uh, can prevent itself from entering into infinite loops or prevent non-terminating behavior. So these liveness bugs that may exist in the browser kernel could cause an adversary to sort of denial of service uh, your browser kernel. So if we consider a model here where uh, Mallory is a malicious process that's uh, sending, that's making calls into the browser kernel, we want to avoid situations where the browser kernel sort of enters into either uh, you know, infinite recursions or um, infinite you know, loops and various other uh, potentials for non-termination. So what we did uh, first is we considered what aspects of a, of a browser would potentially introduce these sorts of bugs. So what are the unique components of browsers, in particular these kernelized browsers, that would allow for such behavior? Um, and so we, we hypothesized that it would be situations like data structures, uh, and then the relationships between different objects. So for data structures, uh, you'd need to show that as you loop over a data structure or iterate over a data structure in some way, that you're dec uh, decreasing the iterator uh, to some point where you terminate. Uh, and for object relationships, in particular, there's, a, there's this concept of a document hierarchy within a browser. Uh, you want to be able to show that as you uh, traverse the hierarchy in different ways, as you look at the different relationships between documents, um, that this traversal will eventually terminate. So we looked, we considered these two, and we went through the code, and we annotated the code with what are called decreases clauses. So at each part uh, where there's a potential for non-terminating behavior, we put a clause in that would say that for each iteration of this loop, uh, something decreases, and eventually we're going to decrease down to some terminating point, for example, zero. Um, so one example of this is just as you look for a particular cookie, if you're doing a get cookie, you may run over a data structure and say, is the cookie here, is the cookie here, is the cookie here? And you just show that the, you know, the size of the remaining array that's left after you've made an iteration of the loop has decreased. Uh, or as you move around the document hierarchy, uh, you may show that as you work your way up the document hierarchy uh, towards the root, the document identifier is decreasing, strictly decreasing, uh, and eventually you'll arrive at the root, which has a document identifier of zero, in which case this you know, particular loop would terminate. You're talking about uh, this about the design level, yeah. right? And uh, this liveness uh, in your example is something very close uh, to the implementation level. I was wondering, like, yeah. how do you draw the line saying right. this is a design, this is right. So that's so that's sort of what I was wondering when I asked the question. You know, what features <coughs> of a browser could potentially, um, you know, what are sort of inherent features to a browser or a browser kernel? Um, you know, they, they've got to have cookies that they manage, right? Well, then they've got to have some sort of data structure to, to, to handle these cookies. Uh, in my case, I'm just using something as simple as an array, right? But I'm saying, okay, well, what's a, what's a, general, um, a, what's a, a general operation on the cookies? Well, get a cookie. So look for all the different cookies that match a particular string, right? And so then you say, okay, well, that's a loop or that's an iteration of some sort. Um, so, you know, I'm sort of trying to extract out, you know, the essence of what's common to the design of a browser. Um, and say, you know, okay, you've got to have a document hierarchy, and you've got to do delegation or something like this in the hierarchy. That requires that you search a hierarchy in this way. Um, so, you know, I'm not looking at, well, the hierarchy could potentially be, you know, the pointer could point somewhere incorrectly. I'm saying there's a hierarchy, and you have to do this operation. So, I don't know. It's a little bit of an art. I mean, it's not, there's no hard and fast answer as to what is the design and what is the implementation. Um, it's just sort of continuously refining the design to get to the implementation. So, David? is looking at the size of the object, or it just says it decreases and it could take some very large but finite amount of time to finish this operation. Yeah, yeah. large finite amount of yeah. time. I mean, just eventually something good happens. Okay. And, uh, eventually it can be a long time. Um, that's just a document hierarchy. Uh, so there's a bunch of limitations to this particular uh, analysis. 
So ultimately, we want to prove sort of absence of denial of service attacks, right? But you can imagine many different varieties of denial of service attacks. You could try to exhaust all the, the resources of the system, right? Maybe you fill the disk up with cookies, and so no one else can make a cookie or something like that. Um, and also, a lot of the common flaws uh, that cause liveness uh, issues are related to concurrent model of execution, right? Locking behavior, deadlocks, live lock. And we're in a sequential model, right? So again, we've limited ourselves to sort of straight line code with loops uh, and iterations. So it's, it's just these loops and, and uh, recursions that could potentially cause non-terminating behavior. And this is something we want to extend. We want to um, definitely get a concurrent model or show equivalence with a concurrent model, show that our security properties are going to hold even if you have arbitrarily many threads uh, executing. Yeah? It seems like a, a better way to prove liveness would be to uh, set, a, set a timer. Uh, you want to show that the, every syscall eventually terminates. And you could do a bunch of analysis and show that there's no loops. But as David says, it could take a very large uh, un but bounded amount of time. Instead, why not simply at the entrance to a system, at a, a browser kernel system call, set a timer yeah. for a certain amount of time. And, and uh, when the timer expires, uh, terminate it. Yeah, I guess, um, I, mean, that, I think that you could prove liveness that way. Uh, you might have a funny interaction with your safety properties because you'd find yourself like potentially returning from any point. Um, so then you just have to prove that your safety properties are sort of invariant throughout. So you said, okay, as long as you, you know, if you're left at any single point here, some, yeah, it has, it's going to have to be, uh, it's, a, it's a slightly different model. It's, it's almost like the concurrent model where you have arbitrary interleavings. Um, but yeah, I mean, that might, that might be something that you do in conjunction to proving uh, standard sort of liveness decreases. Uh, I guess I'm thinking that from a systems perspective, yeah. that you'd want that anyway as a fail safe. And right. once you have that, isn't that sufficient to prove your liveness property? Yeah, I think, I think that would be sufficient to prove my liveness property. There might be something in between, too, which is if you weren't using transactions, you might want to pull at certain interruptible points to see whether you should port. Okay. And in that case, you want liveness between the polling points. Okay, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a bunch of different, <coughs> different ways to prove it. This is just what sort of the first step in what we were saying. You know, if we can prove liveness about this particular design, well, then at least we can say you don't, don't have this particular attack. Okay, um, so the current framework which we developed, uh, the browser model itself is about 1,200 lines. I think it's one of the largest Daphne programs written. Rustan uh, told me this the other day. I think he's written two that may be larger himself. I expect it to probably be a little bit larger when I complete the total design. Um, this, oops, the specification itself for these properties is only about 100 lines. Um, and these are mostly really simple checks saying things like, well, as long as none of these are null, then this happens. And these are the kind of things I'd like to avoid. N none of these you know, variables are null initially. Sort of the sort of sanity checks you might make. Uh, I think these are something that I can either automate or uh, somehow separate out separate out from the more interesting logical bugs in the spec. So right now what we have in our model, uh, which you can build on top of and extend, uh, are a bunch of web-specific aspects like URLs, origins, cookies, um, you know, history, um, server client communication, web messaging, uh, navigation of web pages. Uh, and we have some more general objects which we've built, uh, which could be built into Daphne, but we had to uh, extend. Things like strings, messages, channels, and windows. Uh, and part of our specification, uh, we've actually mostly completed the liveness properties uh, and non-interference and the safety properties are sort of in progress still. Uh, it's a little bit more, the, the safety properties themselves take a little bit more time to specify just because there are more points where they could potentially be violated. And the liveness properties had some sort of very local specification. There was only like two points that actually looped and it was pretty easy for me to say, well, they decreased like this. Uh, the effort so far is roughly two person months, uh, but this includes not just working on building the browser model, it includes understanding a browser kernel implementation, uh, reading the background papers, um, researching the security properties, sort of you know, coming up with what properties might be stronger than what was specified in the paper. Uh, learning Daphne took a, a lot of time just because it was somewhat experimental and somewhat undocumented. Um, so, I mean, maybe in terms of actually building the model itself, maybe it only took a month or something like that. And I expect one to two more months before I've answered a lot of the questions which I've sketched out in this presentation. Uh, so briefly, I just want to go through two things that lowered the verification costs uh, from what it might have otherwise been. Uh, the first was abstraction, just focusing on only the security-relevant aspects, looking at access control, information flow, 
utilizing mathematical objects like sequences and mathematical integers rather than having to worry about some of the nuances of uh, the actual systems implementations. Uh, as an example, you know, we have an abstract channel which is meant to model passing messages between different principles and it's just a message queue. It's, it's just a sequence and you're just adding things using standard operations to sequences. So this is sort of a very abstract design level. Um, and one of the other things which we've done which is somewhat novel is we, we look at how to reduce the verification costs by looking at only security relevant components. So when the designers of this particular browser kernel looked at, at and built their system, they did what we were calling coarse grain partitioning. They extracted the particular functions, components, and memory areas which were relevant to the security property that they had in mind. Uh, but what we've done is gone beyond that and looked at those particular functions themselves and extracted just sort of the instructions that, that are, that are uh, representative or relevant for security. So something we're calling making security skeletons. Um, and the intuition here is that if an instruction or action does not modify the store uh, and it doesn't change the adversary's behavior, then this particular action could be eliminated or this instruction could be eliminated. And a good example there is something like returning an error code. Uh, there actually is a fair bit of code which, you know, is propagating error messages, sending error messages. Yeah? Are you trying to talk about information flow properties? Couldn't the error code be dependent on the kind of input? Or is that something you're checking? It could, yeah. So that was, then, in that case, it would be, I would try to push the specification sort of further into the kernel to the point where I can say, oh, well, okay, at this point there was the assignment <laughs> made, and then try to say, oh, it's violated at this point. Um, but yeah, it could if it somehow flows all the way out. That could increase the size of it. Yeah, yeah, I think you're totally right. I was actually like working through an example which was going to be on this slide, and it sort of kept propagating further out, and it was like, hmm. So this is why I have no, no soundness proofs for this yet. <laughs> so this is just sort of something we have in mind, and I hope I can prove some simulation argument. Uh, okay, so. We have this framework, what questions can we ask? Uh, this is relatively straightforward. You know, you could look at different properties. Uh, you could look at different adversaries and you could incrementally modify the browsers and say, well, if I add this particular component to the browser or I add these incoherencies or different principle definitions, uh, what properties might it provide? And I think we're pretty long on time. So this is just another example of a particular property I tried to prove but I found wasn't provable. Uh, because we didn't look, didn't understand the uh, application semantics. Uh, and another example we're going to do is we're going to look at different navigation policies. So currently, when you have these aggregations, uh, these different relationships uh, are used to specify who can modify the URLs of uh, of different principles. So we're going to look at how different navigation policies affect the security properties, in particular the security properties that we specified. So currently. Um, some browsers say, well, if you're up just higher up this aggregation hierarchy, you're able to modify or navigate pages, uh, change what, you know, what servers they're uh, connected to. Um, but some restrictions have suggested that, well, maybe we only should allow the parent to write to a child, not all the way to a descendant. Right? And so the question in that case is, well, what adversary model are they considering? You know, what's the interesting attacks that that would defend against? Because this comes at a compatibility cost. Right, you're going to try to make these modifications. You're going to break some portion of the web. You're also going to fix something. But what is that something you're even fixing? Right, and so this is one way where we can say, look, I can give you an absolute guarantee that this, this attack isn't going to happen anymore. Uh, but at the same time, there's other frameworks that will tell you, well, it's going to break 2% of web pages. Right, so now you have a little bit more information to evaluate. Do you want to make that change or not? OK, so I'll so we'll finish up with some future work and open questions. So we'd like to prove that these security properties we have so far are... What would we uh, What's up? Oh, I don't even know. This is just experiments which I want to do now that I've oh, built okay. the framework. So this is sort of... I'll hope to do this, you know, in a couple months. <laughs> so we'd like to prove that the security properties we have so far are preserved in a, a concurrent model. I'd like to actually prove something a little bit more general. Is I know that if you put what we've implemented into a concurrent model, it's going to violate a lot of the correctness properties. You're going to get variables which have values which they shouldn't have. But is it the case necessarily that the particular variables that are relevant for security are going to have values which they shouldn't have? Will you get into a bad state? I'd like to show that um, in this particular, in a concurrent model, the particular operations that are, uh, this browser is taking are sort of invariant, uh, despite being concurrent. Can you show how you can achieve it? So we think that 
um, th there is some parts of the browser kernel which are sequential and some parts which are concurrent. In particular, in the sequential components, sometimes you're, say, adding a principal instance, a new principal instance. In the concurrent components, you're doing the work which is associated with maybe rendering or navigation or something like that. And some of that work may be totally benign. Right? It, it may not leak information, uh, like which we're worried about. Right? So it could be that you know, the sequential parts are the security critical parts. Uh, we like to look into ways to sort of automatically partition the system. So currently what's been done is that you know, designers of systems will, automatically, or will manually extract um, the kernels that, that they believe uh, sort of encapsulate the security properties. And this is sort of a time-consuming process, as I think a lot of people in the room know. Um, and I'm wondering is, can we automate this to some way? Uh, perhaps this is equivalent to slicing, um, or maybe it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and if we can't automate it, can we prove the soundness of this partitioning? Or can we even go further in sort of a completeness theorem that says, well, yes, we've got, you know, every single line here matters. And this is the minimal kernel uh, so far. Uh, a little further down the road, we'd like to look at how we can use refinement on our model uh, to actually give a proof that we get a provably secure implementation. So we can take this model, uh, which actually isn't super far from the C-sharp, which is already there, uh, and maybe prove that either the C-sharp is a secure refinement of it, or refine the Daphne model itself to the level where it's executable. So we have a path you know, to potentially getting strong security guarantees at the implementation level. Uh, and finally, we're just wondering if to make this thing a little bit more automatic, um, perhaps it's the case that we are, are within a decidable fragment of first order logic. Um, but this is something which I've not even come close to evaluating yet. OK, so there's a bunch of related work. There's been some formal analysis of the web space done already. The most closely related one by, um, by DevData is uh, a model which is using the alloy system. So basically what they've done is rather than um, having sort of a programming language and a specification, <laughs> Um, they program everything in first order logic. So if you were to look at the specifications, it's about 9,000 lines of first order logic uh, that then go into a system that uh, determines the implications of those. So I think uh, this is good work and it's much more broad than ours. It's looking at the web space in general. It's more than just browsers. Uh, but what we're doing is sort of studying the browser in more depth uh, and we've built a framework to, to do that. And it's something that I think will be easier to use by designers of, of web browsers uh, then, then saying, oh yeah, go ahead and just transfer those 3,000 lines of C code into all of the, into the first order logic formulas which represent which, what, what specifications they satisfy. That's a pretty daunting task. Uh, and I can imagine that you know, it'd be much more difficult um, to sort of get people to use that sort of framework. So there's been some work on um, formalizing the core of a browser before. Um, some people from UPenn have done uh, a model of Firefox or a browser. Uh, that's well typed and has some typing properties. Uh, what they haven't done is sort of specify uh, sort of the application level security properties. So they're considering some sort of definition based on reactive non-interference, um, but they haven't done that yet. So it's a very similar line of work. Um, I think we're just slightly ahead of them in that we are you know, looking at different properties than they're considering, uh, and we're actually doing some verification at this point. So this. this this work is uh, built on a bunch of technical foundations, uh, work I've been doing with my advisor, work that uh, Rustan has done to develop Daphne, and many, many, many more things here. But these are just sort of the basis for this work. Um, and there's been some informal web design and analysis, uh, in particular work by Helen, that has uh, directed us to where I should be looking when I do my analysis, what properties should I be specifying. The browser kernel that we were looking at, the, de the design which I extracted was based on you know, specifications and documents by Helen and her group. Uh, and one of the things we want to look at is one of the, they've developed this notion of incoherencies is what properties are provable in the presence of incoherencies. When you have different namings for principles, what properties are provable in those cases? Okay, so to conclude, we developed a framework for principle design and analysis of web browsers and primitives. Uh, we target the design level. We want to be au as automated as possible. As you can see, we have to specify manually our specifications in our model, but then the proofs are done for you. Um, we're, we want to do a sort of enable sound reasoning where you don't get back lots of false positives. Uh, we've tried to make it as extensible as possible by making it modular uh, and making it easy for designers to use. Uh, we did look at a, a kernelized browser model in this framework, um, looked at different adversary models and different security properties, um, including some security properties that were specified in the original publication and some things beyond what the original publication thought were provable. Um, 
And we <laughs> showed that in a couple cases, security design decisions have sort of significantly reduced the verification cost. We don't know exactly how long it would take if these design decisions weren't made, but we can imagine looking at, say, you know, millions of lines of code and building the, the browser kernel from that, which is what was initially done and handed to me. You know, that process would take much more than two months. So it would have more than doubled the time I've spent. Uh, in addition, the way the adversary models are specified, and I think a general approach to specifying adversary models makes it very easy uh, for me to then take it and put it into this model. And sort of a question I would like to leave the audience with is, what can we do to sort of incentivize the system designers to help, you know, or what can we do for them that sort of symbiotically decreases, uh, in improves security, and helps decrease the verification costs? So currently we know that, you know, kernelized systems are easier to verify. Certain adversary models make it easy to specify these adversary models. What else could be done? Uh, what other reductions could be done at the design process that then lead to lower verification costs? Uh, and this you know, could be use of various tools, various annotations, a whole variety of different things. So to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge all these different people um, sort of were super helpful. This work would have never been accomplished. Um, these are in addition to my mentors. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, Rustan helped with you know, the Daphne tool. My office mate Gregory helped with the definition of security properties and just having someone to talk to. David gave me motivation and uh, provided you know, the direction for the work. Alex and I talked a lot about the browser kernel itself. Uh, and then Sagar, Anupam, and Limin are, are uh, my colleagues back at Carnegie Mellon who were useful to bounce ideas off of. So that's it. Thank you. Sorry, it took a long time. No, <laughs>